Okay, so we're going to look at Eden Rock by Charles Causley. And before we start, I'd like you to read that through by yourself. Just see if you can make sense of what's going on, what might be going on. And don't forget, you're going to read it through to the um, punctuation rather than stopping at the end of a line if there's no end stop. You'll need a copy of your anthology, you'll need a, a pen, and you'll need to be able to pause this and annotate as we go along. Okay, so you should have read the poem by now, and you should have appreciated the fact that it is a speaker in the first person who seems to be giving you some sort of memory, who seems to be giving you some sort of account of a picnic, and then it all starts to get a bit odd afterwards. Um, I thought I'd cut and paste the full um, poem. I think there might be a little bit missing from the bottom. I'm hoping that you can see the final line of I had not thought that it would be like this. First bit, here we go. It's actually using para rhyme. It's actually using half rhyme. Because, believe me, and I know you'll be reluctant to accept it, some people, you've got that suit, feet, dress, grass, hat, light, straight, out, screw, blue, is full rhyme. Suns, spins, way, leisurely, believe me, it works. Bank, think, the vowel of, is this. Okay. In the centre, full rhyme, maybe things coming together, before it all becomes a little bit different, a little bit the change in tone, maybe a sense of threat or reassurance. Whenever you get pararime, you have to look at exactly what's going on with it. And pararime, it doesn't connect. It's not as satisfying as full rhyme. So the poet here could be using pararime to actually imply things are disjointed, things are disconnected. It's uneasy. This line, in terms of I had not thought it would be like this it adds up to a kind of sense of, of the familiar being made unfamiliar. This wasn't what I was expecting. You've also got in terms of the um, meter, it's written that each line has 10 syllables apart from the ones that don't. Okay, and that's, that's kind of easy to say, but I think you've got that one goes long, that one goes long, and I think that one goes short. And the rest of them are 10. Um, look at the lines that go longer. That's got a sense of announcement about it for going longer. Um, genuine Irish Tweed, his terrier Jack. Um, could be the, the length kind of the pride. And here it's kind of to, to emphasise kind of everybody. You, you take that extra beat and you look at the mother. Um, you may also say it's got that disjointed nature of memory behind it. Um, what can you connect it to? Well, it's a significant moment. They are significant adults. There's the idea of parents and children, um, the different relationships. You can talk about him moving from familiarity and comfort to having to accept that the relationship's changed, there's an inevitability about growing up or going through life. You can talk about the child's move from innocence to experience being um, brought out by the idea of Eden. Generally kind of that the whole tone of the poem takes on that kind of um, uncertainty of memory despite the fact there's the detail there, um, it, it's got that kind of shimmeriness of memory. If you want um, supplementary notes, and I very much recommend 
that you do this for all of the poems we talk about in class. I would recommend that you look at The Art of Poetry, so those eight and nine notes on Firefly. And if you want a kind of quick review, then to look at Mr. Bruff. But remember what you're doing, you're trying to think, if I got this in an exam, what would be the points that I would definitely want to make about it? What would I talk about in terms of imagery? What would I talk about in terms of tone? What would I talk about in terms of the title? How am I going to make an argument that the form and structure and the tense that's used actually um, enhances the meaning in terms of the relationships in the poem? Okay. Um, ask me if you have any queries. Other than that, I'll be checking that you've managed to write this up for next lesson. Okay, so to start with, looking at the connotations of the title. There's actually an idea of the setting in the title. And actually, you might want to look at the connotations of it together and individually. So starting off, it's not a kind of actual place. You can't find somewhere in the UK that's called Eden Rock. Sometimes if you look this up on the internet, at the end of the poem, there are another couple of lines attributed to Causley, where he carries on and says, someone asked me where it was the other day. Uh, I said, I've no idea. I answered them it was in Dartmoor. You're always safe with Dartmoor. So it, it's not a real place. It's a constructed place. So I'd kind of make the note that actually it's constructed. So then we've got to deconstruct it. If you take rock, it's got connotations of stability, strength, solidity, arguably unchanging. And in terms of relationships, this is a poem about a relationship where there is that sense of security. Ooh, that's going horribly wrong. security in it. Then we go over to the more fruitful kind of idea of Eden. Where have you heard of Eden? Hopefully you have started to say the Bible. It's a biblical reference. And actually you're looking at the connotations of a now lost paradise. Okay, Adam and Eve were in Eden. They um, defied God, they ate um, the apple from the tree of knowledge, or Eve, first of all, was tempted by the serpent to pick and eat the apple from the tree of knowledge. And as a result of that, they became aware of their kind of um, nudity, they got cast out. It, it Eden represents everything mankind has lost. So you're looking at there, it's a move from innocence to experience. Okay. Whenever you get something about Eden, whenever you get something about the fall, as it's known, you're talking about a movement from innocence to experience. And here, um, it's it can be a poem about growing up, it can be a poem about realising things as you get older. So straight away you've got this idea of setting in the title with biblical connotations, and we'll see where we can go after that. So they are waiting for me somewhere beyond Eden Rock. So actually, it's arguably beyond paradise. And you get the idea that this poem can maybe be read in two different ways. First of all, just as a memory, it's a family picnic. It's a detailed memory. Um, there's the details of the tablecloth and the bottles and the dog and their mum, and mum's dress. Um, but there's also, it becomes a little bit kind of strange when you start getting things like the three sons and, and I had not thought it would be like this. And some people have interpreted it as if this is symbolising a kind of movement towards um, death or into an afterlife. 
as always with these things, you can hold both of those interpretations in your head at the same time. And it, it helps to do that. They, initially you don't know who it is, and then it explains that it's um, parents. They are waiting for me. So the speaker has been left behind. But the implication is that he's going to be reunited somewhere. My father, 25, in the same suit. So that idea that there is a fixed memory. Okay, whatever happened, the father has not got older. It's genuine Irish tweed. Now, Irish is correctly capitalised. Tweed, technically, as a brand name, is, is or as a material, is correctly capitalised. But that genuine, it implies pride. Maybe his father valued that suit. The idea that this is a an, um, a pleasant memory. It's it's affectionate. You know, he's remembering his father in the same suit, and he was used to say, you know, it's genuine Irish tweed. His terrier Jack, still two years old, trembling at his feet. So we have this idea of this memory that's frozen in time, maybe. And the sense of its significance is increased by that end stop. It has a sense of, I'm going to tell you this, I'm going to present you this idea. The idea of waiting, you can also expand out a little bit. It's the idea that, are they waiting in the memory? So if we're just thinking of a picnic, were they actually just waiting the other side of the stream? So are they literally waiting in this memory? Are they waiting as adults? waiting for the sun to join them in adulthood? Or are they waiting in heaven? Are they reappearing to guide their son at the end of his life? It's a kind of reassuring, fixed presence. And then just like we've we've kind of frozen the father in, in time, in memory, also get the idea, my mother. And look at, if you're comparing this, you will have kind of looked at that idea of the pronoun defining the relationship. She's young. You know, they're 23 and 25. Sprigged, it has connotations of nature. And growth. Vitality. Vitality meaning kind of youth liveliness. It's a sprig dress drawn at the waist. So actually, if you think of the old fashioned, I'm going to do one of my drawings now, dresses in terms of almost like a 1950s dress. It's that kind of thing. It's drawn in at the waist to emphasise a narrow waist. Um, it's feminine. Ribbon in her straw hat. So this is a special occasion. Has spread stiff white cloth over the grass. And we're going to pick up on the idea of white. Her hair the colour of wheat. Again, kind of yellow, golden. Um, it's more kind of positive imagery. Takes on the light. So mother is being presented as almost angelic. Heavenly. Pure, positive. Okay. The idea that the stiff white cloth, we're going to discover later in the poem that maybe they don't have a lot of money, they're recycling old sauce bottles, but it's that kind of domestic image that she's actually, you know, she's, she's bleached and starched the cloth. She is a good, um, a good mother a good wife and it takes on the light if you imagine a kind of angel being shown against there that's almost like a halo she pours tea from a thermos so that's a flask 
the milk straight from an old HP sauce bottle. So a screw of paper for a cork. So this is all, it's frugal. And frugal means you're trying to save money. It's a kind of domestic scene. You know, they're trying their best. And at HP sources, you can see that in the supermarket still. They don't have a cork. She's used a screw of paper. It slowly sets out the same three plates. This is familiar and comforting in its familiarity. Tin cups painted blue, it's kind of recycled. And this is where it gets a little bit stranger. The sky whitens as if lit by three suns. That is a simile. And it changes the tone. Okay, it gives it that kind of slightly otherworldly feel. My mother shades her eyes and looks my way over the drifted stream. And that line breaks interesting because looks my way, looks at me. You have that pause there created by the line break. And then it emphasises that actually there is something separating them over the drifted stream. All of a sudden the landscape is unfixed. My father spins a stone along the water. Again, if you take at that line break and look at the ambiguity there, if you stop reading My Father Spins, again, you get that idea of not fixed. Things are unstable a little bit. When you read the whole line, My Father Spins a Stone Along the Water, you get that reassuring kind of um, familiarity of, OK, he's skipping stones. And then leisurely, and then... Even though there's the end stop there, in terms of line, it carries on the same sentence across the quatrains. Okay, so actually, you get the idea that things are maybe um, carrying on, linking up, coming together, becoming more. Um, I don't know. I don't know how you describe it. Um, it's not. It's it's kind of less structured, I guess. And they beckon to me from the other bank. So sentence order or word order wise, you've got they and me. They're separated, but they want to call, they want to call him across. I hear them call. See where the stream path is. Crossing is not as hard as you might think. So it's using dialogue. It's one of the few poems that uses dialogue directly. Um, direct speech. You can use it either way. Crossing is not as hard as you might think. Well, look at the literal and the metaphorical meanings. If you're looking at literal, these are two parents reassuring a son, reassuring the child that, come on, you can do it, just jump across the screen, stream. Whereas if you look at a more metaphorical impression, they are trying to get him to cross some sort of border, some sort of boundary. Is this kind of next um, transition, is this an afterlife? Crossing is not as hard as you might think. You know, letting go of everything is not as hard as you might think. But this quatrain is odd because there's this big gap here. The fourth line comes in, um, it's separated from the others. So it could represent the distance. And it's the distance between him and his parents either geographically or, or in terms of in ideas or states or so, but also in terms of their attitudes. I had not thought that it would be like this. What? What was he expecting? Um, he's, he's on his own, whatever he's doing, he's, he's got to do himself. You get the idea that this is a significant moment either a significant literal moment from the detail of the memory or a significant moment in terms of life, in terms of transition. Okay. You've got the parents 
who are calm. You know, mother is doing the maternal thing. She's looking out for the son. Maternal means to do with mothers. Father is doing the kind of expert thing. Think about follower. He's, he's doing something that requires a bit of skill. Skimming stones. Looking then at um, the form and structure of it, you've got five quatrains. Okay? And actually, although it may seem that you don't have um, any rhyme in it when you look at it first of all, actually you do. If we go